Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending this evening's um, event. This is um, the IOPPN's Twilight Lecture Series, and um, it's open to staff and students and many others from the Institute. Just to let you know that we're recording the meeting. Um, my name is Emily Finch. I'm Clinical Director of Addictions in SLAM, and I'm honoured to um, introduce Professor John Strang, who's going to give a lecture on preventing heroin overdose deaths with citizen training and take home naloxone. How Quentin Tarantino helped us change global policy and practice. For those of you that don't know, John is a leading clinical academic who's conducted extensive addiction and he's worked with governments to improve responses to problems of addiction and related complications. He's worked in the addictions field as a clinician researcher for 40 years and has an active interest in working with policy. He's led the addictions group at the IOPPN since 1995, and he's only one of a small number of senior, ac senior academic addiction researchers outside North America, identified by as a highly cited author with a rate of citation in the top one half of 1% of all published researchers in the last two decades. John will present his slides followed by a Q&A session. Please submit your questions um, via the live Q&A, uh, which is ne next to the chat button in um, Teams. And please do upvote questions or we'll read out the questions. So welcome, John. Thank you for inviting me uh, to talk with you today and thank you Emily for the introduction. Uh, I'm having intermittent uh, cut out so if that happens and interferes with the talk if somebody could cut in let me know. So I'm going to be talking about preventive deaths through citizen training and the pre-provision of take-home emergency naloxone and uh, as Emily uh, introduced uh, we'll be looking at how Quentin Tarantino helped us uh, in this work. Let's remind ourselves about who this concerns. This really matters. Those who die are my brother, perhaps your sister. They're my mother, perhaps your father. They're my son, perhaps your daughter. They're my friend, perhaps your neighbour. Before going any further, let me make clear that I'm telling a story to which many have contributed. So that's colleagues in the university, clinicians, policy makers, in particular innovators and early adopters, as well as advocacy groups who've shared the vision and those who've funded our work. Also, crucially, the families who've stepped up to speak about this problem. So this slide carries my photograph, but it's important for me also to remember where I came from. Many of you in the audience today are students or trainees here at the Institute. I too started as a trainee here at the Institute and at the Maudsley, although admittedly a few years ago and when fashions and dress code were clearly very different. I have the privilege now of leading the National Addiction Centre here at IOPPN within King's and at the Maudsley Slam where working with influential and trusted colleagues, we explore issues across drugs, alcohol and tobacco, with clinical trials, population studies, etc., and with a particular interest in policy analysis, as well as how science can stimulate innovation. Within the National Addiction Centre, we provide opportunities for students to undertake a master's in addictions, and we also collaboratively provide the International Distance Learning IPASS course, uh, an, an international master's in addictions. Before proceeding further, let me declare interests. So I've worked extensively with treatment and care providers in the NHS and in the voluntary sector, and have also worked with government agencies, that's UK and international, as well as working with pharmaceutical companies to try to develop uh, and identify improved medications for the treatment of addiction problems. Uh, for further details, you can check our web pages. In the talk today, I plan to cover five areas. Firstly, the nature of the problem, 
Secondly, whether there are any particular concentrations that should guide us to where to study more intensely. Thirdly, the need to understand overdose more fully. Fourthly, the search for better ways to tackle this global problem. And fifthly, a glimpse into some of the new areas that we plan to investigate. It's remarkable that the problem of drug overdose deaths does not attract more public and political attention. Sadly, this is likely a result of the lack of care and compassion on the part of many in positions of influence in the public debate, alongside the shame and stigma that affects families with loved ones who are troubled by addiction problems. Let's look at these data from the US about the steady increase in the extent of drug overdose deaths and how this overtook the number of deaths from road traffic accidents more than a decade ago, and it's still rising. And the situation is similar in the UK and many other countries. Let's look at this US situation in some more detail, especially as they have been so severely affected. The situation is best considered as several overlapping epidemics. On the one hand, there's been a steady rise in the number of deaths from prescription opioids, as we can see here, with a fourfold increase in deaths over the last 15 to 20 years. And then if we look at this graph on the right hand side, we can see the more recent overlapping epidemic of deaths from heroin overdose. So that's more recent, but rising more steeply. And then if we squeeze a third graph on the right hand side, you can see the even more, the even more recent rapid rise in deaths associated with the highly potent synthetic opioid fentanyl. So that was initially with diverted pharmaceutical fentanyl, but increasingly from illicitly manufactured fentanyl and its derivatives. And we have our own troubles here in the UK. Over a decade during which we believe that the heroin problem has in many ways plateaued, we nevertheless see a continuing increase in heroin overdose deaths. For many of us, it's hard to believe that this is not connected to the severe funding cuts in treatment services that we've seen across the country with the resulting evisceration of treatment agencies. The situation has been particularly severe in Scotland, attracting international attention and a current public inquiry. It's interesting to look at the characteristics of those who've died. So let's look at these data from Scotland. So this is a problem that mainly affects those who are middle-aged or older. And these deaths are markedly more frequent amongst men. All pretty disturbing and devastating to the families and communities concerned. Are there perhaps lessons to be learned by scrutiny of when and where these overdose deaths occur? When in particular do these deaths occur? There are some remarkable concentrations. We now know that they're more likely to occur in the first couple of weeks of treatment and also more likely to occur in the weeks following completion of treatment or after leaving the apparent safety of rehab. It certainly makes Amy Winehouse's song all the more poignant. And there's a particular concentration of deaths in the days and weeks following release from prison. So let's look at this example in a bit more detail. <clears throat> the prison population matters hugely in this analysis. Whereas heroin addiction probably affects less than 1% of the general population, it's something like 30% of the prison population who have a history of heroin use. <clears throat> 
Whatever else it achieves, prison creates a concentration of those with previous drug abuse histories. Here in this influential study, my colleagues merged the data on deaths with the data of prison release to examine not only the extent of drug related deaths soon after release from prison, but also the timing of these deaths. So here we have a graphical display from this paper of the timing of nearly 500 deaths that occurred amongst 50,000 prisoners on release across the 12 months following their release. The first thing we can see at the right hand side of this graph is where we can see the excess mortality of this population as a whole. With half of this excess mortality being in the maroon colour, indicating that these were drug related deaths. They were almost entirely deaths from heroin and the opiates, although often in combination with other drugs or alcohol. However, let's also now look at the two bars on the left hand side. These show the horrific concentration of deaths in the first week, that's the first bar, and the second week after coming out of prison, and almost entirely deaths in maroon, deaths from drug related deaths, mostly from drug overdose. So of individuals coming out of prison with a previous history of heroin use, one in 200 was dead within a fortnight. So we have to ask ourselves, might this be some strange UK phenomenon? Well, the answer is no. When we look at the results from a meta-analysis of studies subsequently conducted in different countries, we find a remarkably consistent picture. With an approximately sevenfold increased risk of death, in the first two weeks after prison release, when you compare it with the death rate in subsequent weeks. Let's now shift to try to work out what's happening. Why are overdose deaths so particularly a feature of heroin and the opiates? One of the many joys of working here at King's is the opportunity to work with people from very different orientations. I had the opportunity to develop some animations with some creatives in the arts department, and we constructed this animation of what happens inside the body after heroin injection. And before we go any further, let me make clear to those of you with an understanding of anatomy and physiology, that I do realise that the trachea does not connect to the lungs directly to the brain. But bear with me and allow me this artistic licence. Here we see that as the heroin comes in and sits on the receptors, there's a down regulation of the respiratory drive and essentially the lungs then stop breathing. We have a crisis situation on our hands. So how might we consider this in more detail? Well, in one of the boldest bits of study that I've been involved with to date, we decided to set up what you might call a heroin overdose laboratory. We were able to establish contact and trust with a small number of long-term heroin addicts to whom pharmaceutical heroin was being prescribed and who were willing for us to study them whilst they self-administered their heroin. Working with colleagues in respiratory physiology as well as across addiction treatment services, we developed a method to study heroin overdose in the, in the laboratory, more specifically within the clinical research facility here on the Denmark Hill campus. Hold on a moment, if you may. <clears throat> 
Okay. So with our heroin addict volunteer uh, safely installed in the clinical research facility, and here we've got some photos from it, we then wired them up and monitored them while they self-administered their heroin dose. So we were able to study in a laboratory setting heroin administration. So let me show you what we found. Here's the baseline reading from one of our long-term heroin addict volunteers uh, who's about to take his regular dose. So this is before we begin to stress the system by increasing the dose further, before we even begin to test whether the overdose response uh, patterns are then more extreme. So here, before he injects his heroin, we can see James's breathing patterns in the top measure, that's in purple, showing the flow of air in and out of the lungs. At the same time, and crucial for us to follow, we were monitoring the oxygen saturation in his blood. So this is the red line at the bottom of this chart, showing a healthy oxygen saturation of around 97%, certainly more than 95%, and stable. Also in the middle, we can see the expected rise and fall in the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the expired air. Uh, so that's the end tidal uh, carbon dioxide uh, shown in green. So this is all by and large as you'd expect. So let me ask you to do a mental screenshot of this chart and hold it in your mind as I take you through the next two charts. Okay, here we go. Uh, here is the respiratory anarchy that we see in the minutes after heroin injection. This snapshot is from five minutes post-injection. We see a major disruption in the breathing pattern. So remember the previous regular pattern of breathing with the purple line at the top, which now has periods of prolonged apnea, so no breathing at all, for periods of up to 30 seconds or more. And let's look also at the destabilization of the previously steady oxygen levels shown with the bottom red line. Where this was previously steady at around 97%, it's now drifting around the place and including drift into dangerous zones below 90%. And similarly, the carbon dioxide patterns, that's the green line, are also all over the place. So what about later on? This was five minutes post-injection. To be honest, it's pretty worrying, even later on. Here we've got the picture after 30 minutes. So we still have a severely disrupted pattern of breathing. That's the purple line at the top. With the oxygen saturation, the red line at the bottom, still far from the stable 97% that we saw at the outset. And with carbon dioxide still all over the place. And this disruption of what would be termed neurorespiratory drive and the breathing patterns, we were detecting this at the normal dose that the individual was injecting. So we'll be reporting in future on the changes that we see uh, after we then have dose increases to this to test it further in our clinical research facility. So this is essentially before we increase the dose to try to aggravate the situation. OK, let's now move on to ask ourselves whether there's anything that we could do about this uh, beyond writing papers about it. Are there any interventions we could consider that might prevent the resulting overdose deaths? Hold on. In emergency medicine, we have a heroin antidote called naloxone. It completely reverses heroin overdose pretty miraculously and almost instantly. This is what it looks like. It's an injectable drug in a glass ampule or in a pre-filled syringe, i.e. ready for injection. Right, we're already in the zone with this animation. Uh, so here we have the heroin, shown in black, sitting on the yellow receptors, through which the heroin is down-regulating the respiratory drive. 
with resulting risk of death from not breathing. And we'll see in a moment that the lungs are in the red lockdown. So what happens if we administer an antidote? So here we can see the naloxone arriving, it's light blue, and we can see it's displaced the heroin off the receptor, and now the breathing is restored. So crisis averted. This is the point at which we realise we could make a real difference. Opiates are the major cause of death from overdose. There's more than 100,000 deaths globally every year. Most of these overdoses occur in the presence of others, and the people who are there are generally willing to intervene, but we've never taught them what they need to do, and we've not equipped them with the means to intervene. Surely this is soluble. Surely it's just a matter of pre-providing drug users themselves and their peers and their families with an emergency dose of naloxone, the injectable antidote, so that they could give an emergency interim injection while waiting for the ambulance to arrive. A sort of heroin user's equivalent of the EpiPen for emergency interim treatment of anaphylaxis. This is the stage in the story at which I need to explain how Quentin Tarantino helped. No, he wasn't doing his PhD with me, uh, but he was absorbing material for Pulp Fiction in 1920, 1992 and 1993, which was exactly when we ourselves were brainstorming the idea that the antidote should be distributed to drug users themselves and their peers. And it's not necessarily delusional. It's not impossible that there was a real connection. With the success of Reservoir Dogs, Tarantino had relocated to Amsterdam and was busily sketching out material for Pulp Fiction. He was also periodically needing a break from Amsterdam and was visiting friends in North London, which included crashing out regularly on the sofa in a house where one of my close colleagues was living. Paul was actively working with me at that time on our studies of heroin overdose. And so I can imagine him talking in the kitchen about the crazy ideas being discussed at work that drug users themselves might possibly be given the antidote. I can't prove it, unfortunately, but it's certainly an intriguing possibility. Anyone who doesn't know the overdose scene in Pulp Fiction, it should be compulsory viewing, and it's one of the great bits of cinema. In my opinion, it's essential viewing. So Vincent has been tasked with looking after the Mia, uh, the wife of his gangster boss, Marcellus. However, however, while Vincent goes to the bathroom, Mia rifles through Vincent's jacket pocket and finds his heroin, which she takes, mistakenly thinking it's cocaine. Vincent returns and finds Mia unconscious and realises she has overdosed. Realising the awfulness of the situation, he drives at breakneck speed with the dying Mia to the house of Lance, his dealer. Lance is much displeased by this unwelcome crisis and the dying body on his living room floor. And then he remembers that he has an emergency injection that might bring this dying victim back to life. I've sometimes been asked what sad people spend their money uh, buying a, a block figure kit of, uh, of the overdose scene. I obviously have to put my hand up as one of these uh, sad people. The script is full of errors. It mistakenly describes the antidote as adrenaline, it mistakenly describes administering it directly into the heart, driving it, driving it through the breastbone. And in the film, it involves a needle that seems to be large enough to skewer Mia to, to the floor. However, it does successfully capture the sense of crisis and commitment to intervene 
And it also presents the drug user as someone we can relate to, someone with recognizable human concerns and willing to intervene if only they are taught what to do and given the wherewithal to do so. So here we have the concept, and this is what in research we would call technology transfer. It's a simple intervention developed initially for the accident and emergency departments, but then broadened to, to extend the benefit by pre-placing it with ambulance crews. And so the next logical step is to train the family and the peer group as workforce, uh, including staff working in agencies and the homeless uh, and those working with addicts in recovery, for example, to train them in how to manage an overdose emergency. And that's exactly what we do if we were training people uh, who were working with individuals who might have an epileptic fit or a heart attack, if that was the medical condition that they were more likely to encounter. Technology transfer. It's such a very simple concept, but all too often a major challenge to achieve. So the first task was to publish a manifesto, or a statement of potential, of method and of intent. This describes the potential to reduce deaths, the target populations, the, the need to improve the product, that's mostly the naloxone, and to identify the potential legal and practical challenges. However, after the original manifesto, there was a need for incremental advancement. So let's now look at some of these necessary steps. First of all, we needed to establish whether this was an acceptable and plausible proposal to our target population. So firstly, uh, to drug users themselves and their peers, did they think this had uh, credibility and plausibility? And also family carers. Overall, there was extremely strong support. We were obviously thinking along the right lines. In fact, we were sometimes chastised for how long it had taken us to realise that this should be done. Next was the first published case report of actual implementation. Uh, this was a little bit like the announcement of a birth in a newspaper. We then needed some more serious scientific study. So next was our prospective cohort study of drug users to whom training and a supply of take-home naloxone were given, reporting on their improved knowledge and confidence and of actual instances of overdoses, which were subsequently reversed. But we also needed to introduce more scientific rigor so we devised a waiting list control trial of the impact of training itself for families and other carers, uh, where we were measuring improvements in knowledge and confidence. And here on the left hand side in dark blue, we can see uh, family members and carers to whom train was given, training was given. Uh, so as I say, that's the dark blue line with marked improvement in knowledge immediately after training and also at the three month follow up in stark contrast to the flatlining of knowledge in the control group, that's in red, to whom training had not been given. And similarly on the right hand side, we can see the marked improvement in confidence for the trained carers, again that's the dark blue, compared with the untrained carers in red, both immediately after training and at follow up. We also realised that a definitive randomised trial was going to be necessary if it was possible to do such a study, if this controversial approach was to gain serious traction on public policy as well as public opinion. But hold on a moment, uh, as we've already seen, we'd already shown that there was a major concentration of overdose deaths in the weeks immediately following release from prison. So here, surely here was the perfect setting in which to conduct a large scale randomized trial 
where we knew that there was going to be a concentration of the deaths that we were then testing whether we could prevent. Now, the ethics of conducting such a trial involved careful consideration, since it would, since it would obviously be unethical just to withhold take home naloxone, which is a drug of known life saving potential, merely to conduct the trial. However, since take home naloxone was not at that time given to prisoners on release from prison, there was a window of opportunity during which it remained ethical to conduct such a trial with provision of take home naloxone to a randomly selected 50% sample of prisoners on release, with the other 50% being released as at that time was normal practice. And then with deaths post release as the primary outcome measure, it was just a matter of merging the prison release data with the recorded deaths data. So scientifically elegant and at one level extremely simple, even if operationally mind bogglingly challenging. Next step in my personal learning was to realize that you need a t-shirt for your project and that take home naloxone needed branding and memorable phrases. And I guess you realize that something significant is happening when with any project you need branded t-shirts. And so we developed ABC naloxone, ambulance breathing recovery position naloxone, as well as the assertive de declaration that naloxone saves lives. We were pleased to see that this that was then wrapped up in the government's own training program about overdose management for family and other carers. And it's important to see this endorsement as it's increasingly incorporated as essential care. Indeed, uh, the National Treatment Agency recognized this recognized the life-saving importance of take home naloxone and also embraced it as a groundbreaking uh, in its contribution. And then there was the powerful political development in Scotland with the Scottish government incorporating take home naloxone as an essential element to their response to the growing problem of drug overdose deaths. And Scotland was the first country in the world to embrace it as, nat as national policy, uh, followed soon thereafter by Wales. And then also across the UK, there's been progressive modification of regulatory controls so as to allow supply of naloxone to drug users, their families and carers without the necessity for a prescription. So in addition to working as researchers and as clinicians, we were needing to work out how to contribute to the policy process locally, nationally and internationally. And on the international scene, an important development back in 2014 was the production of guidelines on community management of heroin overdose, including giving emergency naloxone. And importantly, the launch by United Nations of their SOS initiative, calling for greater awareness and competence in the prevention and management of opioid overdose, including their 1990 target, a clearly declared objective that globally, 90% of those likely to witness an overdose should have received training in overdose management, 90% of those trained should also have been given a supply of emergency naloxone and 90% of those with a naloxone supply will be carrying it on them at the time of need. At a personal level, this included exciting travel, such as this trip to Tajikistan on top of the world, next to the powder keg of Afghanistan and its heroin stocks, to establish and initiate wider overdose training and community naloxone provision. So in the final section of my talk, let's spend the last few minutes uh, reflecting on the challenges still to be addressed. 
In addition to greater public and political commitment, we need to drive for better science so that we can make good interventions better. So we need to be the ones who ask awkward questions and demand better answers from ourselves as well as from others. And in these last few minutes, I'm going to choose just three illustrative examples of how we can move up a gear and do better science. I've already introduced you to the idea of a heroin overdose laboratory. On the one hand, the idea seems awful. But on the other hand, bearing in mind the sad reality of more than 100,000 deaths per annum, we desperately need to have a setting in which we can test scientific questions and obtain answers that have a real applied relevance. Beyond just the observation of physiological changes after injection of someone's standard dose, we can also investigate uh, the different effects of an actual overdose within safety limits or of the injection of complicated cocktails, mixtures of drugs, uh, perhaps heroin with alcohol or heroin with benzodiazepines, or of changed tolerance and dependence, for example, after detox. It's also interesting to speculate on whether we could perhaps also investigate a potential protective effect from a new generation of medicines that could be developed. And this is work under discussion and potentially in development. For the second example, let's look at the product itself. It's been a major obstacle that naloxone is an injectable drug. From early reading, it seemed clear to us that a concentrated naloxone nasal spray should be feasible, even though the concentration would need to be at least an order of magnitude greater than the injectable product. After much searching, we eventually found an industry partner, Mundi Pharma, who were willing to work with us in development of a concentrated naloxone nasal spray. And working with them, we identified the pharmacokinetic profile of the two milligram concentrated nasal spray. Uh, so that's the uh, red line uh, in the graph of plasma concentration over time that you can see here. We identified the two milligram concentrated nasal spray as the best integration of speed of onset of effect. So that's, as you can see on the red, we're wanting an effect within the first five to 10 minutes, uh, combined with a better duration of effect. And this takes, one, takes us up to two hours on this graph. And as a result of this work, we now have an effective concentrated naloxone nasal spray available across much of Europe uh, and Australia. Indeed, we now have several different variations on the concentrated naloxone nasal spray in different parts of the world. Personally, I'm rather impressed with the elegance and portability of the latest arrival that's in the bottom left, which is a new nasal spray from Norway which is provided in a container which fits the pocket much more easily. I've previously talked about how important it is for new naloxone products to pass the Levi's jeans test. So they're actually with us, they're on our person at the time of need. And for your amusement, slide amusement, here's a brief video clip of this low tech but important test. So it's important because it addresses the major problem of low levels of carriage of naloxone in everyday use. Impressive. Huh? Despite our interest in developing the concentrated naloxone nasal spray, we were also aware that there could be limitations. What if the overdose victim had damaged, damaged their nasal mucosa from years of drug use? What if they had a he heavy cold? What if they vomited, as can sometimes occur with overdose? Consequently, we wished to explore possible future improvements on nasal naloxone 
The conclusion from our systematic review was that we should consider either the buccal mucosa or the rectal mucosa. Uh, we decided to explore the buccal mucosa. So might it poss be possible to produce an effective rapid dispersal buccal wafer? Working across addictions, clinical pharmacy and the Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, all here within uh, King's, and with recent experience of using lyophilization as a means of developing rapid dispersal medicines, we demonstrated the physical and chemical feasibility of producing a lyophilized naloxone wafer with comparable dosage to the new nasal sprays and with the characteristics of dispersing within 20 to 30 seconds. It has good characteristics across a range of temperatures, different con concentrations and different potential solvents or diluents. It also promises good stability over time. So the next step would be to be testing it in healthy volunteers, but we need to find a committed industry partner yet to be secured, but definitely an exciting possibility. And then the final area of science that needs to be developed further involves a particularly powerful investigative probe, which is often carelessly overlooked. That's speaking to the patients themselves or the population concerned. In conversation and by listening with an open mind, we can learn much about the problems we are trying to address or the conditions we are trying to treat. This will often involve listening to voices which are not always comfortable or even in concert, but the dissonance is something we must bear in mind as we try to make progress. From listening and from study of verbatim transcripts of actual experiences of overdose reversal, it became clear to us that there was a danger of over antagonism, over reversal, in which the overdose is not only remedied, but is also done to such extreme extent that the patient is thrown into an acute withdrawal syndrome, not only acutely distressing, but also a trigger for aggression towards the person who's just saved their life, and also triggering further drug seeking and drug taking to reverse the reversal, thereby compounding the problem, especially as the naloxone wears off. So this has led us to consider the feasibility of dose titration instead of just regarding naloxone administration as a simple binary decision. Indeed, working with colleagues in New York and in Melbourne, uh, we've established that it's more than just the triggering of, with, of withdrawal symptoms and anger. We now find from qualitative and mixed methods analysis that withdrawals and anger are likely different phenomena. So this is now ripe to be explored further and for the implications uh, for emergency care and public policy to be considered carefully. For many of us, this involves uh, learning different research methods, different research orientations and developing new partnerships. This can be scientifically exciting as well as challenging. It involves reaching across scientific boundaries and an open mindedness to learning different types of science and different ways of thinking. A final fantastic option for the future might be that there could be wearables that would detect when oxygen saturation dips below a critical threshold and might then implement action, maybe an alarm and an emergency call at the very least, maybe even a resuscitative, ac resuscitative action in their own right. These ideas are definitely right for exploration, but they're also right as a topic for a separate talk. So let me conclude. What do we need and expect from science? We crucially need better understanding of what actually happens in opioid overdose and also what potential points of leverage there may be to prevent overdose deaths. We need these insights to guide us across bench to bedside, or I guess from laboratory bench to park bench. We need to understand what happens in actual heroin overdose and why and how death, deaths occur and occur for some and not for others. We need science to guide us towards potential levers, be they 
pre-protective or reactive, which prevents the fatal outcome which can so often occur. And we need this contribution from across science, scanning genetic, physiological, environmental and policy spheres. And we also need science to scrutinize implementation efforts, examining poor delivery as well as exemplary delivery to establish how best to generate benefit, lives saved and public good. And what actions was, must we ourselves commit to? In addition to anything else that you may take away, I trust that firstly, we've established that we have a major problem globally of opioid overdose deaths, which is not receiving the attention it needs. Secondly, we have the added problem that shame and stigma keep the problem in the dark, and it's our responsibility to bring this problem into the light so that it can, we can address it more properly and more humanely. And thirdly and finally, there are interventions we already have in our armamentarium, so some at the level of public health and public policy, some at the level of individual treatment and care. And the patchwork variable nature of provision of these interventions is shameful. We have the ability and we also have the responsibility to make the science and policy advances that are already achievable. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Back to you, Emily. Thank you, John. I, I hope people can hear me. Um, that was a fascinating run through the development of take home naloxone. Um, I have a series of interesting questions. Um, I think a good place to start might be to ask you what resistance has there been to citizen training? And perhaps why might be a good, good mission. Yeah, it, it's an important question. Um, when we started on this work, uh, I think we experienced some of that resistance ourselves. There, were, there was a, a, an instinctive view that we couldn't possibly train drug users to become uh, barefoot paramedics. Uh, and then we, we had to question our own assumptions that there wasn't competence. Uh, and then realised that we were ourselves inadvertently applying a, a discriminatory approach to the to the individuals that we were trying to uh, trying to work with, and uh, I, I, I think probably in modern parlance uh, we'd refer to this as an unconscious bias. There, 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 there's been an extraordinary hesitation from a lot of colleagues in the clinical domain, in the policy domain, uh, which has not been overt resistance, uh, but has been a sort of inertia, a, a slowness to embrace it. Uh, when we then took it to the target populations, so populations of drug users who were currently still active in their drug use or in treatment or people in recovery, and very poignantly, when we took it to family groups, uh, there was almost a universal uh, embracing of this and a question of you know, why did you not bring this antidote to me? Uh, I, I remember a particularly poignant um, one of the one of the first training events we did with family members. Uh, somebody came up afterwards um, and said, you know, how pleased they were to have had the training and how pleased they were going to be to have naloxone because they were worried that their daughter was going to overdose and they just wished that it had existed. You know, they wished that naloxone had existed uh, earlier because their son had died of a heroin overdose a few years previously. And it was very difficult to have to then explain, well, actually naloxone did exist. It just never occurred to us that we should place it with you. And if you think of how we've made those transfers for other medical interventions like adrenaline, uh, I mean, 
the, the EpiPen is one of the most obvious examples, uh, but cardiac defibrillation, you know, I would never have thought that there would be defibrillators in leisure centres and shopping malls. It, um, and we need to apply that same thinking uh, to this area. Uh, actual opposition has been rare, but inertia has been widespread. Um, an interesting question, another interesting question is, um, where in the world is the most progressive approach to drug treatment and management? Um, I, I, I think that's a question for Emily Finch. <laughs> yeah, Scotland, perhaps. Um, I, I think I, I think what is worth our while doing, and I, I'm probably not going to spend long on the question because it probably is a different uh, a different topic. I mean, it overlaps with with this area, but we can certainly identify countries that have got into a mess, got into a particular mess. And um, those with particularly uh, hardline draconian measures do not seem to come well out of an analysis. Uh, so in the book uh, that I was involved with putting together about drug policy and the public good, uh, we, we were able to look at different national policies and realise that those with very heavy prison sentences uh, there appeared to be no benefit to them and possibly there was harm to society as well as the individuals from the extremes of penalty. Once we got into the area of between the middle zone and the more liberal countries, the differences were much less obvious. Um, so it's easier to identify countries with bad policy uh, than necessarily to decide on who's got the best policies. Another question. Um, can't having a quick and powerful antidote at hand encourage people to use heroin, so remove the fear associated with it? Yeah, I, I think this is one of the really interesting questions because uh, one of the points I was making in the talk is that we have to, you know, if we wish to be good scientists and to move the field on, we have to stand back from our own interest and ask the awkward questions ourselves. And I think we were one of the first uh, groups to say, was there a danger that this would occur? And from the very start, we uh, we explored it. Um, it. It's sort of difficult to work out how you get a clear answer to it, but we, we certainly surveyed drug users themselves about whether they would uh, engage in uh, the technical jargon for it is risk compensation. And what you discover is there's a whole literature about risk compensation. Uh, I can choose two other examples. Uh, if we have a car with much better brake, you know, with anti-skid brakes and with seat belts, do we drive faster and or do we do we corner, take corners more sharply? And uh, the answer there is, yeah, there is an extent to which that's true, uh, but it's uh, but it's nothing like the extent of the benefit from the anti-skid brakes and the seat belts. The other example is there are Cochrane reviews also about. Uh, wearing helmets when you're snowboarding or skiing. And there again, there's some evidence of slightly faster and more extreme snowboarding or skiing when you're wearing a helmet, uh, but pales into insignificance compared with the benefit of wearing the helmet. And I think that's what we're talking about in the, uh, in the field of illicit behaviours like uh, heroin use, uh, that nobody's trying to have an overdose. Uh, it's a hazard that creeps up on people without them thinking it's going to happen today. And the bigger teaching problem is to get people to realise that they need to prepare themselves for the unexpected event. And that's where the point I was making about portability. It actually needs to be there on the person on the day they didn't ever expect the overdose to happen. OK, OK. John, I think a, perhaps a good final question is how do you see how do you see heroin management in 10 years time? I think what the questioner means is heroin overdose management in 10 years time. Yeah, I, uh, I, I've become increasingly um, dictatorial in my view on this. I mean, uh, personally, I think uh, there should be 
take on naloxone should be something that is distributed to every family in the world and that there shouldn't be a home that doesn't have emergency naloxone in the bathroom cupboard. Uh, why wouldn't there be? It's a cheap drug. Uh, it, it doesn't constitute any risk to somebody other than in this life-saving situation when it can be used. Uh, I, I think for for our professions, you know, across everybody working uh, with people with addiction problems and more broadly with drug users, uh, we need to have the notion that this should be routine. This should be routine practice. Uh, it also occurred to me that with the uh, repeated attention to stop and search, uh, one of the conversations I was having to one of the service user advocates was that. Uh, it, it wasn't a serious suggestion, but then you start thinking afterwards, maybe there is a serious content to it. Should we reconceptualize stop and search uh, as being that you should have your naloxone on you? Uh, this be a complete turnaround from being worried that you might have drugs on you to being worried that you might not have your drugs on you. Uh, but I'm not sure whether that would um, get real political traction. OK, OK, it's. Six o'clock, I think. Um, John, thank you very much. Well, um, thank you for the time as well. We have there are a few questions that haven't been answered, and I'm going to suggest that people email them too if you're happy with that. Yeah. That's fine. Um, and I've been asked to say that our next talk will be Wednesday the second um, at six o'clock with Professor Karen Steele on what can mice tell us about human deafness. So, a very different subject. Thank you, everybody.